5, verse 17. And uh, if we're going to put a topic on this, it would be change comes when we follow Christ. Being a Christian, being Christ-like the best that we can. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ that is engrafted in, joined to him by faith, in him as Savior, he is a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition, have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. Now that's with the Amplified Bible, so I don't want to confuse anyone. Whatever helps you, that's fine, I, just so you get the scriptures. Um, but mine will always kind of bring it out a little bit more. Uh, what is a Christian? That was our question Wednesday night. And many of them says, well, you'll see, you know, a different attitude. You'll see, you know, you won't want to be in the same places as you always went. You know, you'll, you'll act differently. You'll speak differently. You'll dress even differently. And, um, and I'm not talking about dressing as some churches do. I mean, you change how you dress. You're not, you don't dress seductive for the world or you don't, you know, put bad things, you know, t-shirts on that are suggestive. You know, you begin thinking about those things um, because your your mind and your spirit becomes, you know, you're, you're drawn towards Jesus. You're drawn towards his goodness and his mercy. We begin to think differently. And, you know, a lot of times somebody will say, well, they're not a Christian. They're doing this or that. Are any of you perfect? Have you got a perfect condition that, you know, you do no wrong? You're just you know, one thing I, I, I've told people, just because you don't dress like someone else or just because maybe you drink or you smoke or you, you know, say a bad word once in a while, or you don't say a bad word once in a while, that doesn't make you a Christian. It's something, it's a condition of the heart that we've got to allow God to help us with. Every one of us has weaknesses. Every one period in this world. Only Jesus is that perfect one, right? So when we look to people, the Bible tells us you shall know them by their fruits. We're not to judge people like, there's a good one, there's a bad one. I don't want to be near that one. I'm not going to sit by them. You can sit by them. They just go on and on, you know. That's how people act. But we can't be like that. We've got to allow the love of God to flow through us so that we can love one another. We can't sit in judgment towards one another. So being a Christian, that's the number one thing we have to work on. Everyone sins and falls short of God's glory. That's what the Bible says. And we cannot be saved by works. And I've said this over and over. Doesn't matter how long your hair is or if you never cut it or if you wear, you know, dresses. That doesn't save you. It's the heart. I can't do enough to get myself to heaven. I can go to heaven if I have a relationship with him, period. A relationship with God every day. That's what's going to get me to heaven because then I change. I'm working on it every day. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 says, Corresponding to that rescue through the flood, baptism which is an expression of a believer's new life in Christ, now saves you, not by removing dirt from the body, but by an appeal to God for a good, clear conscience, demonstrating what you believe to be yours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some churches teach baptism is important. It, there's no way it's about salvation. It's just you telling the church, I'm going to join, and you know, you're part of the church. This word of God says it saves you. It is vital. Because first to come to God, we have to repent. We have got to realize that we just sin. We're a sinner. So we got to ask for forgiveness to cleanse us. And there's cleansing in the water. That blood represents God's blood that he shed. Once we go down in that water and we come up, he forgets all the sins. Doesn't matter if you murdered someone. Doesn't matter how bad you were. Doesn't matter how many people you hurt. 
you are forgiven because God has chosen us to be washed, cleansed by the water, to walk with him in newness of life. If we're carrying around our old sins all the time, you're never going to get rid of the baggage. You know? All the hurts, all the anger, all the, you know, whatever it is. If we need to be washed in the blood of God and his blood that he shed for us so that when we come out, we can walk in, in a new life as a brand new babe asking the Lord to teach us through his word. That's when we change. That's when it comes. But we've got to first repent. God won't forgive you if you don't repent. He just won't. That's biblical. The Bible says in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And then ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. That's Bible, isn't it? That's not Sherry picking it out. And when you look through all the baptisms, go through Acts, Romans, they were all baptized in his name. That's the Bible. It's not shared. It's the Bible. I'm one that has to stay with the Bible. I'm not going to give you my opinions or my thoughts. It's going to be what it says. And I can never be told that, oh, well, they're teaching us this, and that's their idea, ideologies. And it's the Bible, the Word. And it will be the Bible that judges us. Not me judging you, not anybody judging you, but we examine ourselves by his word. Am I following his word? To believe, you know, the Bible does say, if you call on the name of Christ, you'll be saved. What does believe mean? It's an action verb. Anybody remember that school? We do something with that. We don't just stand and, okay, I don't have to, yep. The devil believes there's a Jesus, there's a God. He believes it, but he's not Christian. What are we going to do with that? We follow what he taught us to do. That's the key. We've got to believe in his word, what he has given us. This is a book all about love. It's a blueprint to how we are to live. It's a blueprint. I know you and Faith have been talking about the you know, the, the big house down there, the mansion, looking at blueprints, reading books to find information about what was in that house at that time because people that lived there wrote books. And you can find information. Well, this is your blueprint to your life for eternity. We will choose where we spend eternity, not God. If I don't follow the word, if I don't allow it to speak to me and change me, that's my choice. I can, I was, you know, my family, Norwegians. And some of those Vikings were animals. I don't want to be like them. I don't want to do what they did, but Leif Erikson, which is in my family tree, what my mother saw, he, the king, gave him permission to go and get the gospel. Thank goodness for one good one in our family that we can find through history. But I, I want to be like him. Not in the specific belief that he was in, but he was teaching about God, God's love. And uh, his father was a rebel rouser, Eric the Red. And um, he was trouble, and he didn't want to believe, but his mother believed. His mother followed him. But I don't want to live as they did, you know, the Vikings. Because when you hear Norwegian, the Vikings. There are some good and there are some bad, just like here, good and bad. But I don't want to be represented as one of them. And I've got Irish and some German. Irish is there in my family. <laughs> and um, they're known to be hot-tempered and all this, but I don't think I'm hot-tempered. But what we've got to follow is him, Jesus Christ. I'm saying all this, that I want to be like him, Jesus Christ. Because that's what matters. I want pe people to see Jesus and me, not our Norwegian Viking. You know, I, I don't want you to put me in that position. But I want people to see what well, she loves for God. She loves God. That's what I want people to see. Romans chapter 3. 
verses 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God has been revealed independently and altogether apart from the law, although actually it is an attested, it is attested by the law and the prophets, namely the righteousness of God, which comes in believing with personal trust and confident reliance on Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And it is meant for all who believe, for there is no distinction. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, green, or orange, or whatever. There's no distinction. He will save whomever will call upon him and trust him. Since all have sinned and are falling short of the honor and glory which God bestows and receives, all are justified and made upright in right standing with God, freely and gratuitously by his grace, his unmerited favor and mercy, through the redemption which is provided in Christ Jesus with whom God put forward before the eyes of all as a mercy seat and propiti propitiation by his blood, the cleansing and life-giving sacrifice of atonement and reconcil reconciliation excuse me, to be received through faith. Through faith. What are you going to put your faith in today? Human people, flesh, will disappoint you. They may say they're going to do this, and they never do. They forget, or <clears throat> it's not important to them, which might be important to you. They may do things to truly hurt you or harm you, but Jesus Christ will not. That pure love is what he wants to give to you and I today. He's already done it. He's already done it before you even knew him, before you understood anything about him. He's already shed his blood for you. For you and I, what will we do? What will we do with what he's done for us? There are seven changes that take place when we become Christians. Seven changes. First of all, we begin to love God. We begin to have a desire to learn about him. We begin to read his word and find out who is he. Why does he love me? That was my question. Why would you love me? I'm a mess. Back then, even more so, but I have my days, I'm still a mess. But why? Because all I saw on this earth was hurt and pain and destruction, and you feel you're not good enough, so you deserve what you get. That's what I felt. Why do you want to love me? And nobody else really does. The pure love's not there. There's always a motive. There's always a, you know, what's the word I want to use? There's not a pureness of love that comes to you. It's conditional, that's the word. Conditional love and people in the flesh have a hard time with that. Many people do, not all. There's conditions. I'll love you if you will do this the way I want it to be done. I'll love you if you believe the way I believe. I'll love you if, whatever. God's love for you is unconditional unconditional. No matter what you have done, if you ask him to forgive you, he will forgive you. If you truly ask him to forgive you of the sins that you are doing or have done in the past, and you want him, you want to be cleansed, and you want to be his child, you'll have no problem letting him have that. Because you know he does love you. And he will forgive you on any given day. We can't do this without him. It's not about us. It's about following through with our purpose in this life. What is your purpose? To love Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. Can you love someone that you've never met yet? If you just talk to him on the phone or just email him, can you fall in love with somebody? If you choose to. We choose whether we want to love or hate. It's a choice. God created us and gave us a choice. The angels have no choice. They're supposed to be obedient to what God created them for. He uses them as tools for us. 
So they, they don't have a choice, but we do. He's not going to make you love him. He's not going to make you do right. He's given you that choice. Will you follow me? Will you follow me? Will you love me? Will you love one another? Will you follow my precepts and my principles? Will you give them to others? Great mercy and love. It is a choice. We have free will to love or hate. That's what I'm trying to teach these young adults because it's really easy to hate someone that has done such harm. It's so easy. You just want to get your hammer on you know, because they've done some horrible atrocities in this world and you hate what they're doing because they are an enemy. But God says to love your enemies. It doesn't mean love their sin, love their soul. You don't have to go buddy-buddy around people. Just oh, God said I have to love them, so I'm going to go. Well, you're up for some hurt because they may not love God or want to know him or anything else. And they're going to hurt you again. But that means pray for them. Love their soul. Care about whether they make it to heaven or hell. Unless they look up to God, they aren't going to make it. Pray for their soul. Don't go back into that Egypt that God brought you out of. Don't go back. we got to love as Jesus loved. Number two is we have to hate sin. I hate it when I mess up. I hate it if I get angry at somebody. I hate it. It's like, psh, don't let it. It doesn't matter if your hormones are upside down. Get over it. You know, pray. I tell myself that all the time. Why did you give in to that? Why do you even let it get to you? It's just some of the things some of us have to go through. But it makes me mad. It's like you know better. Why did you even, psh, what's the deal? Who cares? So we need to hate it. We need to hate sin. It's not okay for us to hurt someone else. It's not okay if, if we want to bash somebody else. Shut up. Let God take care of that in there. That's sin. Love one another as Christ has loved you. We have to hate that sin in order for God to help us with it. If we don't hate sin, the sin that we do or have done, and we just want to keep on getting in there because it feels good, and who cares what anybody else thinks? I'm not hurting nobody else. You are. You hurt everybody around you because they see a, a side that they shouldn't see. They hear things that they shouldn't hear out of somebody that is a Christian and loves God. We all have to allow God to help us with this. Number three is prayer. We begin to pray. To me, the word pray for some people, they want to run. When you say pray, we need to pray. But what I want to say is we need to talk to God. He's my father. He's my friend. He will listen to me at all times. I'm just going to go talk to Jesus. I'm not going to use that pray word. But if, not, if it bothers somebody, just go talk to him. Just talk to him. I told the teens today, if people really saw, well, the young adults, people really understood he's right here anyways. He sees what you do. He knows your attitude. He knows your heart. If we really got it in our head, we wouldn't do the things that we do. Would we, Becca? We wouldn't. Because we'd be so conscious. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to disappoint him. I want to live for him. I want to please him. That needs to be our heart. So when you talk to God, give him everything, your whole heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit, everything. And it says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, do not be anxious or worried about anything, but everything, every circumstance, every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God. Tell him. It's not petty stuff. He cares about the little things and the big things. He cares about everything. He cares whether you get up in the morning and you're hurting. If your back's hurting or something, not, he cares about that. He wants you to talk to him about it. You know, like a little, if you have a, little, a new baby, you're going to spend time with that new baby. That baby's going to want mama or daddy to feed them. You know, a toddler, you know, wouldn't it bother you if when they start walking, they don't want to come to you? That would hurt my feelings. If my baby didn't want to come to see me, 
if they didn't get excited when I came home or something, that would hurt me. It's like, they don't want me. Well, think about it. In truth, this is what God feels. when, If I don't want to take the time to tell them about what my plans are in the day, and ask them, what do you want me to do? Is this what you want me to do today? That's how much he cares. He cares about what your plans are. He cares about where you're going. He cares about what you see and what you hear and what you do because he's your father. He is your creator. And he's here with you. In verse 7 it says, And the peace of God, that peace which reassures the heart, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands and guards over your hearts, and your minds in Christ Jesus is yours. That's yours. You know, for several years now, I've been having trouble sleeping. And that's insomnia, where I could be up two days at a time. I just cannot sleep. And I've been praying and praying. And about a week, two weeks ago, I changed the way I prayed. I changed the way I prayed. And I've been getting into a lot deeper study than what I ever have. And I just told God, my heart's going to give out if I don't have rest. And I need your rest, not my rest. I need your rest. I need your peace. I don't want to be thinking about everything all the time. You know, not having anxiety, but just thinking, praying for people and situations. And you know, this past week, week and a half, I might go to bed 9, 10 o'clock at night. 11 is late, but I'm sleeping. Now that is God. Amen. That is God. It started over three years ago when we had it in our home. We had, we had problems, and I had to stay up at night to make sure no one got out of the house. And that's all I'll say. But I stayed up, made myself stay up and stay up and stay up. And, and I was that's how much I love my kids. You're going to, you know, I'll stand in front of you to keep you from doing what you're going to do or what you're thinking you're going to do. You better believe it. I'll stand in front of your door. That's my child. Their soul is in trouble. Though she found another escape through a window. So that, I, can't, I can't help with that. But I did everything I could. And so I was, my mind, trying to, when you're trying to rest and go to sleep, you're still on crisis mode. Just always watching, always thinking. I don't. We don't have that problem now, but you know, it's something as a parent. And so I never was able to, you know, relax. I guess at that point. But I'm so thankful for what he's done because it feels so good to be able to sleep and to sleep all night. Fourthly, we need to read and apply the teachings of the Bible. We're not just supposed to hear it. You know, a lot of people come to church and just, I'm here, I'm listening to the, the preacher talk, and that's all I need to do, and I'm a Christian. But we can't deceive ourselves. We need to be doers of the word, not just hearers. That's what the Bible says. In James, let's go to James chapter 1, verse 25. 21 through 25. So get rid of all uncleanness and all the remains of wickedness, and with a humble spirit receive the word of God which is implanted, actually rooted in your heart, which is able to save your souls. I can tell you from my own testimony that this word will renew your spirit. This word will renew your life. It will deliver you. That's what brought me back into being a person, per se. When I came to God, when I met him, for two years, he had to teach me how to believe, how to trust his love, how to trust him. He changed my thinking, my life. I saw I was important to him. I found out what his love did for me and everyone else. I began to have faith. I began to trust him. That word, your word that you hold, need to, needs to be as gold to you. He wants you to study it. He wants you to write in it. He wants you to make your notes. Some people won't dare bend a page. This is my study book. We are in school. 
this is a school of learning our life down here. What we do down here, God will use us in certain ways down the road, out of this world. But when Jesus comes back with the, for the church, and he's, well, when he comes back and brings the church back here, we are going to be overseers of those that made it through tribulation. There's a reason right now that this is our time. We are in a school of learning and growing in him. That's why it's important to apply the word to our life. God, what is my purpose here? Teach me. Teach me. It says, but prove yourself doers of the word, actively and continually obeying God's precepts, and not merely listeners who hear the word but fail to internalize its meanings, deluding yourselves by unsound reasoning, contrary to the truth. We do that, don't we? We just find loopholes. That was, I heard a preaching this morning talking about there are no loopholes in love. Perfect love, there are no loopholes. When you're talking about when, when Jesus said to love thy neighbor and talking about the Good Samaritan, why the two verses are the most important. Well, the, the one man asked Jesus, but who is my neighbor? And he wants a loophole. I don't want to love everybody. So who is my neighbor? What do you mean by that? Be specific. We can't be looking for loopholes. When Jesus asks us to do something and commands us, we need to trust him. He has a purpose greater than what we know. That little rascal that sits up into that pew, you may know things that he's doing or trying to fake out, but they don't, he don't fake God out, she or he. God sees it all. But we are to love our neighbor when there's a need. We are to love them no matter, no matter what. If the church could get a hold of that all across this world, we wouldn't have any strife in the church. We wouldn't have no problems because you truly love one another. And you prefer them over yourself at all times. For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it, he is like a man who looks very carefully at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgets what he looked like. I can look at it. It's like perfume. You put perfume on. You smell it right when you spray it. But after you walk away and through your day, you can't smell it on you. But other people can. So when we look in a mirror at ourselves, we only see, you know, through a glass darkly is what the Bible says. We don't see a clear thing. We may think we look so good. We might have purple hair and, you know, different. <laughs> but we don't see what God sees. Okay? We look at things differently. So that's why we need the word of God to help us to see and understand. But he who looks carefully in the perfect, into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and faithfully abides by it, not having become a careless listener who forgets, but an active doer who obeys, he will be blessed and favored by God in what he does in his life of obedience. Let's go down to verse 40, 27. Pure and unblemished religion, as it is expressed in an outward acts, in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit and look after the fatherless and the widows in their distress, and to keep oneself uncontaminated by the secular world. The church in this world, this church, all churches need to understand we are to look after the widows and the fatherless. I think we got four widows here, four or five widows in our church. And we have, I counted, seven children that do, does not have a father figure, a father in the home. We as a church, that's our responsibility. Do they have needs? We've got to take care of our church first before we take care of everybody else. And we need to take help others. We do. But we need to be focused on do these kids need socks? Do they need shoes? What do they need today? You know, is there any needs? Widows, do they have food? Or do they need help paying certain bills? I, when I was a widow at 44, I lost all my income because my husband had the income plus he took away what I had left. Lost cars, lost my home, everything. But did anyone from the church see if I had any needs? Not one. Not one. Not one. 
Pastor Noel. And I never forgot that. So when I think of widows that are struggling, some live with their families, and that's okay, but they still need us, the church. Whether they have families or not, we are responsible to care for the widows and the children. It's not about my, me, my money, their money. It's not about us. It's about what God puts in the word for a purpose. We cannot let them fall away. We cannot. What do they need? For these children that don't have a father that's a strength in the home, they need somebody, people in the church that they can look up to. What is the example of who Jesus is? It's us. Thank goodness a mother brings them, but that mother can't do it all. I can attest to that. They, you're, you can't do it all, and I don't expect you to. But as a church, we need to be more sensitive to what we have in here and what the needs are. I'm talking to everybody, not, not just, you know, we think the board is like a candy store. Give me, give me, give me. That's not, that's not it. But what are their needs? Because that's not the way a church should be either. A candy store, whatever they want. That's not what it's about. We have to be wise stewards of what we have. But every one of us, let's start being sensitive. When you see these little children that come here, whether they live with their mother or their grandmother, whoever, I don't care. They don't have a father to look up to. And Jesus Christ is their creator and father. But they need men in their life. They need women to help strengthen the mothers and the children to always be there. That's something that's very, it matters to me. we got to focus on these things. Number five was turn from the works of the flesh. We need to end here. So we need to stop and look at ourselves and see how we are living our life. What are the works of the flesh? I'm going to have you read more at home because I'm not going to go over it all. But write this down, Romans chapter 1. Read chapter 1. In Galatians 5, 16 through 21. And the last two things is we produce the fruits of the Spirit when we live for God. Write down Galatians 5, 22 through 26. This things I want you to read at home. It's very powerful, very easy to understand. This is what God wants to produce in our life. And last of all, we got to live by faith. Live by faith. Trust. Say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm going to stand in faith. Just believing you're going to make the way because I can't do it. Nobody else can do it. There are times that you've got to, it's got to be God that you go to. My mother and father, I never told them things that I may have needed, and if I would have told them, they would have worried, and they would have made sure I had it, but I, I came to trust God, and he made the way every time, every time, and I learned a lesson through those hard times, and I'm thankful for every one of those lessons. It wasn't fun why I had to walk through it. It's not fun when you're walking through things. It's... It, it, it's just heart-wrenching sometimes, but there's a lesson. And he is who you need to go to for your strength. God is the healer. And only he can heal. 